Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Mullen. I'm an emergency physician here at the UC Davis Medical Center. Today, we're gonna to talk about the California Bridge Project. Treatment starts here. And what that means is you're gonna to learn today about how to treat patients with opiate use disorder, wherever you see them, in the emergency department and in the hospital. I want you to leave here today knowing how to take care of this patient population on your next shift or your next shift in the hospital or the emergency department. This is the disclosures. This effort has had many partnerships with the state of California, the California Healthcare Foundation, and the organizations up on the left. I'm speaking for myself and not for them, although they did support this effort. This is really where the, all of this effort started with Gail D'Onofrio at Yale. She did a study looking at patients with opiate use disorder treated in the emergency department. Patients were randomized to referral to treatment, a facilitated referral with some motivational interviewing and treatment starting with the emergency department and a warm handoff to outpatient treatment. The patients that were followed for one month, 78% versus 37% in the referral group were still in treatment at one month. This study showed us that we have a huge opportunity in the hospital and in the emergency department to help get patients with opiate use disorder into treatment. This is a remarkable study that started this whole effort. We also know that right after hospitalization, that is when we see an increase in drug-related deaths. Patients leaving the hospital are at a higher risk for death from overdose from their substance use disorder. So not only do we have an opportunity to get patients into treatment when we're taking care of them in our emergency departments and in our hospitals, but without treatment, they're at a very much higher risk for death. We also know that treatment works. Patients who have an untreated opiate use disorder are at a much higher risk for death. This is a high risk patient population where we can have a big effort in getting patients into treatment and saving lives. And that's what we should be doing in the emergency department and in our hospitals. So let's talk a little bit about buprenorphine. What is this magic drug that I'm gonna tell you about and that is saving patients' lives? Buprenorphine is a partial agonist. So that means it is, if you took heroin and naloxone and brought them together, what you would have get is buprenorphine. It acts on the opioid mu receptor, but only partially. So we see less respiratory depression and less central nervous system effects. It's got a high affinity for the mu receptor. So what that means is it will bind to that receptor and kick off anything else. So if a patient has just used morphine or heroin and you give them buprenorphine, it's gonna knock all that other drug off the receptor and bind tighter. It also means if I load a patient up on buprenorphine, they leave my emergency department and go use a bunch of heroin, they will have no effect. So it does protect our patients. How does it work? Sublingually takes effect in about 15 minutes and we'll see a peak action about an hour. It is approved for the treatment of withdrawal and it does work well to reduce physical dependence and craving. As I mentioned before, with buprenorphine being a partial agonist, there is a ceiling on respiratory depression. So unlike full agonist, fentanyl, heroin, morphine, with buprenorphine, the more you give, you don't see the same decrease in respiratory depression. What that means is it's really hard to overdose on buprenorphine. You have to really try hard to overdose on buprenorphine and probably be a toddler. So this is a very safe drug for us to use. Also, you'll see the, the more you give with buprenorphine that it just tends to last longer. This is one of my favorite studies, Sharon Walsh. She gave high doses of buprenorphine up to 32 milligrams to non-opioid dependent volunteers. So these are people who are not using opiates, do not have tolerance built up. And guess what she found? The same ceiling on CNS effects and respiratory depression that we saw in dependent patients. So again, this is a pretty safe drug that's really hard to overdose on. And again, this slide just shows you that at higher doses, what we see is not necessarily a greater effect and certainly not a greater effect on respiratory depression, but it just sticks around longer. This is really useful for us in the emergency department because it helps us to bridge patients 
for a longer period of time so that we have time to get them into treatment from our emergency departments. So what happens if we just give buprenorphine out to patients, like I'm talking about? What are the risks? What happens if we just sort of open up the spigot on buprenorphine? Fortunately, we have somewhere to look. In 1995, that's exactly what the French did. Without any training, without any restrictions, they basically said you can, to all their physicians, you can go out and prescribe buprenorphine for patients with opiate use disorder. And what happened? They, buprenorphine was given out at much higher rates without any testing, without restrictions. There was no protocol. It was essentially they just turned on the spigot and sent buprenorphine out into the communities. So what, what do we think happened? Amazingly, their overdose death rate dropped by about 70%, which was a remarkable achievement. So what we've learned from the French experience is it's okay to get buprenorphine out there into patients' hands, getting patients into treatment. That's how we're going to solve the opiate crisis in this country. So here is the protocol that we've developed with the Bridge Project on how to get this started. There's a lot of words on this page, so we're going to dig deep and teach you how to do this. So first question, is your patient in opiate withdrawal? We're going to start with a patient who's already in withdrawal. The reason for that is, remember, buprenorphine has that higher affinity for the mu receptor. So if your patient's not in withdrawal and you give them buprenorphine, it kind of acts like naloxone and you will send that patient into withdrawal. So how do you know? This is fortunately the COW scoring system, which we have, which will help you to diagnose opiate withdrawal. I like to start with a patient with a COW score of about eight. You can use this, you can look at it. There's a lot of online calculators and calculate where your patient is in their withdrawal scale. So let's go back to our algorithm. So I have a patient who's in withdrawal and their COW score is about eight. What do I do? I give them eight milligrams of buprenorphine sublingual. If my patient's not in withdrawal, we should probably wait. If they're in the hospital, you can just wait a couple hours because you know that inevitably they will be in withdrawal. If you're in the emergency department, it's probably best just to say you might want to come back when you are in withdrawal. The risk is that we would send them into withdrawal and they would feel worse. So back to our algorithm. I've just given a patient eight milligrams sublingual. What do I do now? Usually what we do in the emergency department is we wait about an hour, check on the patient and see if they feel better. At eight milligrams, that patient should feel significantly better after an hour. If you get zero change with your eight milligram dose of buprenorphine, you might wanna think maybe this person wasn't in withdrawal. We're using that one hour break as a chance to kind of reassess and see maybe this person had something else going on. Thyrotoxicosis, sepsis, some other medical disorder that's not withdrawal. Because at eight milligrams, you should see an effect. Except every once in a while, we will have a patient who does not take it sublingually and actually chews and swallows the buprenorphine. That's another reason maybe it didn't work. So remember, eight milligrams, sublingual, wait an hour. Then what do I do? Usually I will give a second dose of buprenorphine somewhere between 16 to 24 milligrams so that I can take advantage of that long acting property of a higher dose of buprenorphine. That gives me time to get that patient into outpatient treatment. So I will give a second dose and then try and figure out what are my follow-up options. I have an X waiver so I can write a prescription. I usually will write for eight milligrams twice a day for about five to six days and refer that patient into treatment. If you don't and you haven't sat through the eight hour required training, which we will talk about in a little bit, your option is because you've given that long acting dose, you have some time to sort out when you can get that patient into treatment. Usually you'd like to have them followed up in about two to three days. Then remember, give your patient a diagnosis of an opiate use disorder or some opiate use. Remember to put that on the chart. Give them a harm reduction kit with naloxone and send your patient on the way. It's that easy. Most of these patients can be seen in our fast track area. 
This is a short visit. We're giving oral medications. What you will notice that is not anywhere on this fancy algorithm is lab testing. We're not doing any background lab testing, no drug screens. This is a pretty easy algorithm that you can do in most of your fast tracks of your emergency department. What if my patient is pregnant? Can you give buprenorphine to pregnant patients? Or what if your pregnant patient came in on buprenorphine? For the pregnant patient who is already on buprenorphine, that is fantastic. Buprenorphine in pregnancy has shown to decrease rates of neonatal abstinence syndrome. And so both the mom and the infant have better outcomes if that mom is maintained on buprenorphine. There are two formulations of buprenorphine. One is just straight buprenorphine. That's what I'm using in the emergency department when I treat the patient in the ER or in the hospital. The other formulation is what I write for when I discharge the patient. That is Suboxone. It's a combination of buprenorphine and naloxone. In pregnancy, we tend to switch to just the buprenorphine product because that naloxone, there's some potential risk that people think it's safer in pregnancy to be straight on buprenorphine. What is the naloxone in Suboxone for anyway? That is there as a safeguard. So if a patient has Suboxone and decides they want to crush it up and inject it and divert it, then the naloxone is activated and that buprenorphine will not have an effect. So again, this is a really safe medication. Except in pregnancy, we're switching patients over to buprenorphine only. The caveat for starting a pregnant mom on buprenorphine is after about 20 weeks, you might want to involve your OB. Some places will do fetal monitoring while they start a woman who's over 20 weeks pregnant. Otherwise, I would say this is a really good opportunity to help both the mom and the infant by getting that patient started on buprenorphine. And once they've delivered, it's also safe in breastfeeding, so that mom should be continued on her buprenorphine. So how do you avoid making a mistake? What could possibly go wrong here? Really, there's a couple things. One, if your patient's not in withdrawal and you give them buprenorphine, you could send them into withdrawal. This is called precipitated withdrawal, and it sounds scary. However, remember, in the emergency department, every time you reverse an overdose and give someone naloxone, you have just precipitated withdrawal. So this is not as frightening as it sounds. If you do send someone in withdrawal, what do I do? Usually I treat them supportively, give them some Zofran, maybe some benzos, and then really what I do is I just give more buprenorphine. The goal here is to saturate up all those mu receptors and you will block the craving and you will block the physiological symptoms of withdrawal but that is mostly a risk if your patient is not in withdrawal when you see them. The other risk is methadone. Methadone is really long acting and so that your risk of precipitated withdrawal and a long withdrawal with methadone is higher. So we recommend waiting for at least 72 hours before you're starting on buprenorphine from a patient who's already on methadone. And then remember, you can still overdose on benzos and alcohol while you're taking buprenorphine. It's really hard to overdose on buprenorphine alone, but you can definitely overdose on alcohol and benzos. They do act synergistically to decrease respiratory depression, so you might want to be a little bit careful there. However, personally, I think if you have treated withdrawal, you're probably less likely to overdose on benzos and alcohol, but it is still possible. So what do you do if you precipitate withdrawal? We talked about this a little bit. I treat my patients supportively. I give a little bit of antiemetics. You can do what you did before buprenorphine, which was give ibuprofen, um, some Zofran. Some people will even recommend going up to Phenergan. Really what I do is I give more buprenorphine. Okay, so you're gonna say, that's great. That sounds super easy, but isn't this illegal? Aren't you only allowed to give methadone or buprenorphine in a methadone clinic? Isn't it illegal to take patients with opiate use disorder and give them an opiate? No, 
I'm here to tell you this is something that is legal for you to do and really that you should be doing. So let's dig into the rules a little bit. In the outpatient setting, yes, methadone needs to be given as part of an opiate treatment program. And that often is what you think of as a methadone clinic where a patient has observed treatment at the clinic every day. Methadone can be prescribed for pain by any provider. Buprenorphine also can only be prescribed by someone who has an X waiver. An X waiver is an a, additional attachment to your DEA license. It requires an extra eight hour of training if you're a physician, an extra 24 hours if you are a PA or nurse practitioner. An X waiver allows you to prescribe buprenorphine for opiate use disorder. Buprenorphine, like methadone, can be prescribed for pain for any provider. And remember, this is in the outpatient setting. So if you plan to prescribe buprenorphine, you do need to go ahead and get that X waiver, which is the additional eight to 24 hour training course. Now, what about in the emergency department? How am I able to give buprenorphine to patients in the emergency department? There is a 72 hour rule, which says it is legal to administer buprenorphine or methadone for the treatment of withdrawal in an emergency. So that means if your patient comes into the emergency department with opiate withdrawal, you can administer, and that means order buprenorphine or methadone for that patient while they're in your emergency department. In the ER, I am mostly using buprenorphine, particularly if I'm sending patients out, but if someone misses a dose of methadone, it is legal for you to order methadone for that patient from your emergency department based on this 72 hour rule. What if your patient is admitted in the hospital? So if I have a patient who has a history of an opiate use disorder and now I am admitting them to the hospital for a wound infection or an abscess or if they happen to have pneumonia, we all know that patient is going to go into withdrawal while they're in the hospital. And what can we do about it here? Well, while that patient is admitted in your acute care hospital for a medical or a surgical reason, other than addiction, you can administer to that patient methadone or buprenorphine for maintenance treatments or to help treat withdrawal. This actually will include new starts. So if a patient who is not on methadone or buprenorphine comes into the hospital for pneumonia, you can start buprenorphine and maintain them for the duration of their hospitalization while they're in that hospital. When you go to discharge that patient, again, if you plan to prescribe, that does need to be prescribed by an X waivered physician. So this is legal. This is legal in your emergency department and in your hospital. And we all know it's the right thing to do for our patients. So in conclusion, patients who are coming into our hospital and into our emergency department with an opiate use disorder are high risk. They're high risk for death. They're high risk for overdose. They're high risk for other complications, HIV, hepatitis C, we all know this. We have an opportunity to get these patients into treatment from our emergency departments and to prevent overdose death on discharge. I know you probably have more questions. We have more webinars coming that will help you get this program started in your hospital and in your emergency department but it really is as simple as this. A sign in your waiting room, a sign a triage, opening your doors to patients who are suffering from an opiate use disorder. You can start them on an oral medication, sublingual, in your fast track, connect them to outpatient treatment, and we can solve this problem together. Thank you.